Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for coming to my studio today and joining me. Um, hopefully, we'll have some fun this afternoon. I'm going to show you what I do with uh, watercolor canvas and gouache and crayon, and the reason why I use those materials, too. So I'm going to introduce you to the materials first. We'll go back over to the table. The and if you have any story. questions along the way, please feel free to type them into the chat. And if I don't have time to answer them during the demo, I'll be happy to stop at the end and take care of any of the questions that you have. So um, feel free to do that. And the materials list for this demo, you will find on the site, if you go to the menu on that front page, you'll be able to see a section called Portfolio. And in there, you'll see my materials list for watercolor classes and also for this demo. So you can download that if you'd like to. And I'll talk a little bit more about the supplies along the way. So here we go. Let's go over to the table and see what we're going to work with today. OK, so I'm working with gouache. I'm working with a particular type of gouache called Turner. Gouache comes from Japan and it's very intense in color. And that's one of the types of gouache that I use. The other one that I use is Graham gouache because it has a little honey in the mix. But uh, you need to know that gouache doesn't work very well in a palette. Um, it works better if you take it from the tube every time you use it. It uh, dries out too much in a palette. But if it does dry out, you can still reuse it. So these are the colors that I'm going to be using today. And I'll show you what we'll be working on in a moment. So we'll put that to one side. I'm using watercolor crayons, uh, watercolor pencils, okay? The watercolor pencils are um, Caran d'Ache and they come in a tin, in a box, and different colors. I have a couple of tins and I separate them out into, into different colors. And so I just have the cool ones in here, but um, they work pretty nicely and they work pretty nicely as, um, as a medium on their own. I use them sometimes on their own just for drawing and soften them into the paper and that's on hot press paper and that's kind of fun to play with those. So I'm going to show you a lot of different things today because um, you will have your own ideas about what you want to do with this and I'll show you what I've done so far and maybe that'll kickstart some new things happening for you this year. We all need new stuff to think about right now. We don't need to think about what's going on. We need to think about our art and so hopefully uh, we'll get there. So I'm using the pencils. These are some of the pencils that I'll be using in the demo today. So I'll just put those to one side. I'm also using Neocolor crayons. Now they're called water soluble artist crayons. Some of them are called oil crayons. They're not really oil crayons, but they come, um, they look like kids crayons, um, but they're not. They actually are water soluble. And so, and they're really valuable for, um, textures and so that's really why I use them more than anything. I use the crayons probably more than the pencils in the paintings that I'm going to show you. So those are available in um, Art Central. They're also available at um, Jerry's Artorama if you want that particular gouache that I was talking about. Jerry's Artorama is one of the few places that you can get that. Um, if you want to buy the surface which is canvas uh, I asked Etty at Art Central if she would stock a few of the boards. So she has some of those if you want to get going, if you get excited about what you're seeing today and you want to try it. Um, you can go to Art Central and she ha also has the crayons and the pencils there. If you would like the uh, canvas in a pad like this, so it's a sheet like this, uh, then you'll have to order that from Dick Blick or from Jerry's Artorama. So this is what I'm using. And this product I found about... Um, after about 2008, after I went on a trip to France, I came back and I decided I would do some paintings based on what I'd seen in, in the south of France, little buildings some villages, all sorts of little goodies back then. And I thought I'd try this, this surface. And so I bought a couple of pads and I had disasters initially, and I'll explain why I had disasters initially. But it also comes in um, a board like this, already stretched over the board. And those are the things that uh, I think uh, Eddie has the 9 by 12 boards for you. So those are the ones that you can use. And here's just a little painting with all three, just a very loose um, interpretation of um, sushi, a sushi bar. And so this has also has a little ink line in it. So it has ink line, it has crayon, it has gouache, it has watercolor, it has all of those mediums. And this canvas also comes in a 
in a frame like this, pre-stretched on the frame, and you can paint the sides. And, and this is also watercolor with watercolor crayon, watercolor underneath, um, watercolor pencil, and um, gouache. And the advantage to painting on these surfaces is that you don't actually have to put them behind glass. So when you're using this canvas or other boards of, uh, that you can paint on with watercolor, you can spray them with a UV fixative, and this can go straight on the wall just like this. So that's great because, because um, it's, it's going to be very useful to you to have an alternative type of artwork that you can, or watercolor that you can put up on your wall. So put that one to one side for the moment. And I'm going to share with you just a few pieces that I have painted uh, recently because I've been taking trips, mental trips, from here to places that I have enjoyed going to in the past to remember good things. And um, just before I go to that, this is just my basic watercolor kit here that I'm going to use to start with. And for my watercolor kit, I've got basically two of each primary and just a few other colors here. Uh, so we won't need too many of those today um, when I get to the subject that I'm going to demonstrate. But I've painted a few paintings just in the last few weeks of places that I have been to that have had good memories. And um, one of those, of course, is Italy. One of my favorite places to go is Italy. So again, this is the same um, idea in that it's on watercolor canvas. It has watercolor, gouache, crayon and pencil on the surface. And I mix those up a lot in different ways, depending on the subject that I'm using. Sometimes I'll use more pencil. Sometimes I'll use more crayon. Sometimes I'll use more watercolor. Sometimes I'll use more gouache in the picture. It just depends. Okay, this is a little demo of um, light on um, a window in Italy. And one of the advantages that I found of using all of these different media is that I can, I can gain a little transparency with the watercolor. I can use a little opacity with the gouache. I can change colors with the crayons. I can change tones with the crayons. I can soften edges because one of the things that you'll find with this particular paper is it has a few limitations. It has some great advantages, but it also has a few limitations that you have to work with. And I'll explain those along the way that I found anyway. Maybe you wouldn't find it quite so limiting. So here's another little subject, um, again, painted on the same canvas in the same way. This time it was wet and wet. And what you'll find with this paper when you use it is that it's going to stay wet longer. It's going to work more like 300 pound paper it's going to stay wet for a very long time. And so that can oftentimes make uh, edges a little difficult to deal with because um, your edges can be either too soft or too hard, depending on how you go. It's not quite as predictable as watercolor paper as far as the edges go. And that was one of the things that led me to using the gouache and the other mediums with the watercolor on this canvas. So, um, any subject will work for this. And the other thing that I like to do in my work is to get in there with my hands because I'm a pastelist and I'm a printmaker and I also like to play with the surface of whatever I'm working with. And so I like to be able to draw on the surface. So you can see all these little circles here that I put in. Those are drawn in with the crayon and with the pencil and they give a nice interesting texture to the subject. So. Uh, there's a lot of different variations that you can do here. And one of the other reasons I like to use this is because I can achieve a lot of different textures with these mediums. So I can have soft edges, I can have sharp edges like we can in watercolor, but I can also do things in the foreground that are much easier on this surface than they would be on a watercolor surface. So on a watercolor surface, I probably have to save the white paper for the red flowers here and for the yellow flowers because otherwise I wouldn't get those bright colors towards the end. And saving the white paper usually means using Frisket, liquid latex, which can be a pain in the neck because it ends up being 
sharp and hard edged. And so you can use Frisket on this paper, but you'll find that it won't be sharp and hard edged. You can also lift most of these colors back to the surface of the paper at any time. So you can clear a little area like this and you can paint on the surface. So it's actually much, much more forgiving than paper. And it's a lot of fun to play with. So I'm going to move that one across. This is pretty intense because it's the Turner gouache, pretty bright colors. If you like bright colors, that's a good way to go. I like playing with little buildings and groups of buildings and textures and fun stuff like that. So here's another one. And these are all little memories of places that um, I like to go to. So one of the good things um, about the crayon is that you can get a lot of texture. You can play and you can draw on the surface and you can achieve texture. You can achieve texture on the buildings too. You can see that granular texture. And that's because the texture is going onto a surface that's like a grid. It's actually a fabric. And so it's, it is a canvas surface. It's a watercolor canvas surface. And the surface itself is treated so that you can paint watercolor on it. And it has a, a special gesso for watercolor that accepts watercolor. It doesn't really get absorbed. Watercolor doesn't really get absorbed. It will stain a little if you use staining colors. But when you paint on it, it will still be fluid. It'll still be loose like this. However, before you paint on it, you have to staple it down if you're using the sheets. And that was one of the problems that I had when I first started. So you can see, you can draw on the surface with line at any time. You can use a little crayon on the surface. I'm going just a little bit closer on this one so you can see. You can use um, a little paint. You can use gouache. You can use watercolor. You can get nice um, little goodies going on in the sky by doing different levels of paint and different types of paint and so I'll put that to one side and another one over here that I have um, so some of these have a lot more crayon in them some of them have a lot less crayon in them some of them have just watercolor um, and not much gouache some of them have more gouache and less crayon so it depends on what I'm doing to um, depends on what I'm doing to, to play with this surface and how I want, to, want it to look. I'm going to use watercolor more if I want more transparency. And so there's a lot more watercolor down here and less of the opaque media. And I'm going to use the opaque media when I don't need quite as much transparency. So it's a play exercise. You can play with it and you can make it do what you want to do effectively. Here we're in England walking in the cornfields in the summer. That was a nice memory. And I can use a little crayon here and a little pencil to loosen up the corn and to give it some texture. Texture is going to be the thing I think that you'll be more attracted to on this particular paper because you can make it much more readily, much more easily by using all of the different media if you want to. And we'll have another one here. We can go back and look at these a little bit closer later to see how much of each of the medium we've used. There's a little bit more gouache in this one, um, a touch more gouache, a little bit more crayon in this one. And the idea was to kind of lose the birds into the sunflowers. So any particular subject is fine. A little trip to the Isle of Man and led me to a lovely little village where they had a port, a harbor, that was very deep with walls that went up high. And seeing the little white boats in there shining in the water was one of the things that really attracted me to this particular subject. And again, this is the same thing. It's a combination of all of these different mediums. Another trip to Italy, which of course is one of my favorite places to go. And one of the things that you can do on this paper, that I like to do anyway, is to, when you have a subject like this that's in the shadow, you don't have to worry about that subject being painted in initially or even being drawn in initially. So I painted this whole thing first and then I came back in and I lifted out the shapes of the people in here. And so that is a big advantage. That's something that you couldn't do on regular watercolor paper. That's not, not possible. 
and the textures on the wall here. I really like the way that I can get textures on the wall, on the floor, so I put quite a few of those in. And if I want something a little flatter, I can use a little more gouache, or I can use the white of the paper here with just a little shadow. So lots and lots and lots of possibilities here. How much or how little paint you put on is up to you. This is a farm that I painted in France many years ago, and I like to play with it in different ways. And so for this one, I just painted the paper with a big wash, warm and cool washes. So burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and both of those together across the whole of the painting, maybe a little cobalt blue in there too. Then I painted the buildings on top afterwards. And for the buildings, all I needed to do was to put in the shadows right here, because this was all part of the underpainting. And I put in the trees in the background here. And then when that was dry, I added a little gouache trees in the trees here. And there's a reason for using the gouache on top of the watercolor, and we'll get to that a little bit more. A little bit here. And there's a little crayon on the surface here, a little of that watercolor crayon. And the crayon will um, soften edges. The crayon will give a little more texture. It'll change the color a little bit. There's a little crayon in here too. If you look carefully, you can see that. So I like to have fun with the surface and I'm really intrigued with what I can do with the surface. And so that's what, it, what it's all about as far as I'm concerned. This was a little tiny train station up in the mountains in the um, Marche region of um, Italy, and it was all by itself in the middle of nowhere, and I like this little group of buildings. And uh, We were on our way to Frassassi Caves, and, and it was quite close to that. And so it was a challenge because there was a fence that went all the way across here, and I didn't want that fence to be too important. And so I painted over a lot of it, and I changed a lot of it, and I've got crayon in here, and I've got crayon in here, and a little bit of watercolor just in the sky for more transparency, and pretty much all of the other mediums everywhere else. So this is what I like to do with the surface, and it's very easy to work with. And uh, one of the reasons that I use watercolor and then gouache, and not just watercolor, is because these are two little figures. One is painted in watercolor here on the same paper. This is a canvas paper and one is painted in gouache. Okay. Now the one that's in watercolor is very light and it's great and I have to do everything pretty much the tones correctly in the first wash. It's much more difficult to layer. You can see here I had a little issue layering with that color on top because it wasn't really spreading very evenly. It wasn't doing what I expected it to do. However, when I did it with gouache, I didn't have that problem. Gouache is just a little bit heavier, and it can be transparent. It can be really transparent. It can look like watercolor, or it can look like oil. Oh. So this is just a little gouache um, demo, a very quick one, uh, with the Turner gouache, which is quite bright. So that looks very much like a watercolor. And this is gouache painted on board that looks a lot more like an oil or acrylic or an opaque medium. So I'm a big fan of gouache. Gouache is something I think that's underrated over here. In England, it's used as a medium. And if you go into shows, you'll see gouache and watercolor painting side by side, or you'll see people mixing up the, the mediums a lot more. Um, we don't tend to separate it out quite as much as um, it's separated out over here. Over here, it's been more of a design medium for many years, but um, it's considered to be a, a medium all of its own um, in a lot of places in Europe. So very simple, very simple idea. You can just play with this. You can play with the idea of putting one layer on top of another layer, which is really what that's about. And one of the reasons that I found that I had to use gouache, well, I didn't have to, but it made it easier, made it more, um, made it easier to apply and um, stopped all of the problems of the paint lifting was that I, I found that the paint lifted too much if I use just watercolor. Okay, so here I've got watercolor on the top one, and I see the paint is lifting up a little bit here. I didn't get the same sort of um, strength 
that I wanted in the trees. And here I've got gouache in the trees. And the gouache is still a little transparent. It's still not completely uh, opaque. And even in here too. But I'm able to get a little more control. And perhaps I'm a control freak and that's the problem. But certainly it seems to work better um, when I use gouache. Okay, So that's my reasoning for doing that. So what I do is I start with the idea of watercolour. And I start with a wash that goes through the background like this. And then I add on a little gouache. And the gouache will give me sharper edges. Every time I add a little gouache on, I'll get a sharper edge. So I use that ability for the gouache. I'm still using the gouache very transparently. I'm not using it opaquely, thickly. That would probably not be good for this paper because it might break. It might crack if you did that. So I'm layering um, one on top of the other and you can go back with watercolor on top of gouache if you want to and then after I've done enough watercolor and gouache I come back in with the crayon. There's a little bit of crayon here, there's a little crayon on this one across here, there's some in the path here, some in there and then if necessary I come back in um, if I want to or if it needs it I come back in with a pencil the watercolor pencil and I can darken edges. I can add a little goodie in here. I can add a little goodie in here. These pencils can be used dry or they can be used wet and when they're used wet they'll go on a little darker, a little thicker and the crayons can be used dry or wet, doesn't really matter and I'm really all about you know what can I do with or how can I make the surface look interesting and that's really what it's what it's about for me. And for you, it might be more about color, or it might be more about shapes, or it might be more about um, the idea that you can lift up again, and you don't have to worry about making as many mistakes because you can always go back to the surface if you need to. So it could be any any. It's all of those things for me. So I decided today to do um, a subject for you that is topical in as much as it's winter. Well, it's winter everywhere else, not quite here yet. And so this is my little tonal study for what we're going to paint today. And it's a couple of barns and some white areas. And one of the reasons I didn't use a full color painting is because it takes a lot of time to build up these layers. And I want to be able to finish this for you in the time that we have. And so for those of you who came in a little bit later, this materials list for all of these is available on the portfolio section under the menu of the site. So you can find that. Um, I want to be able to finish this for you and I want to uh, be able to show you what to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the watercolor and the gouache part of the painting. And then we'll take a little break so that you can get your eyes away from the screen because looking at the screen for a couple of hours is just a bit too much. And then we'll come back again and I'll work on the pencil and the crayon part of the subject after that. So this is um, a tonal study on tone paper. I like to use tone paper because it gives me an idea of how the painting looks. Sometimes if I'm doing something that I want to do specifically in watercolour with a lot of white left, I will do a tone tonal study um, on the white paper. But if I'm not leaving white paper particularly, um, then I prefer to do the study here um, on toned paper because it seems to be a little easier to see as a painting um, rather than sometimes on the white paper it's not quite as easy to see and certainly in pencil it's not quite as easy to see. So this is a subject that I'm going to be painting for you today. A couple of barns and I'm not really the barn queen. I do actually like barns um, because they're simple buildings and they have lived a life and that's what I like about these little buildings and groups of buildings, that uh, they, are, they have a life of their own. Um, but today I'm going to uh, play with these and we're going to start off with a sky um, in watercolour. I'm going to use a couple of blues for that. I'll use cerulean and cobalt for that one. And then I'm going to work a little bit more on watercolour all the way through. And by that time it'll end up being a very loose watercolour painting that could stand alone all by itself. And for a small painting like this, that might work just as well. For a larger painting, I think you always need a few more little goodies to look at. Um, so that when you've, when you've looked at all of the loose um, 
effects, then it's always nice to have something else that's a little bit more detailed to, to appreciate within the painting. So that's my, my feeling about that. So let me put that to one side for the moment and put the study over there. So we're working on this paper. And the issue that I had when I first started playing with this was that I was just putting it on the table like this and painting on it and wondering why it was buckling so much and why I couldn't flatten it. So after a couple of paintings and a lot of frustration, I figured out that I probably should fix it somehow down to a board. Now, back in those days, there wasn't a whole lot of information about the surface. Now there's a lot more information. So what I found was I needed to staple it down. If you're using the paper, it's absolutely necessary to staple it down to a piece of gator board. And you just put your staples in and put them fairly close together, okay? Particularly if you're doing a large painting. Don't just put one or two or three because it'll still buckle and you'll have a problem flat. You won't be able to flatten it, period. It doesn't work that way. You can't wet the back and do what you do with a normal watercolor painting. That's not the way it works. So um, take a look at that. And so it's very, very important that you do that. You do not have to wet it. You can do it dry, okay? Staple it dry, just as it comes off the pad like this. And I'm just going to use this, these little pieces here to test the colors as I go. And so I'll put this to one side and we can start right away. So I'm going to start with watercolor and it's a good idea to use a brush that's really juicy. So I'm going to use a little mop brush here. I'll come out just a bit further so you can see what I'm doing here. And I'm going to use some mid-tone blues, some um, maybe, let's go on this side so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, cobalt blue, a little cobalt blue, and a little cerulean together. A little bit more texture, cool it down a little bit. And to check that on the paper. Now it's important to check the colors on this because you will find that it dries much, much lighter. Again, like 300 pound paper. It'll stay wet longer and it will dry lighter. And that looks like it's going to be a really strong color, but it's actually going to dry out to something more like this. Okay, so I want just a little bit more color in there in the sky, just a touch more and enough to be able to cover that whole area. So the juicy brushes, the sable brushes will work best for watercolor. And then I use the, um, that should be fine. And then I use the um, synthetic brushes for gouache. You don't want to use your good brushes for gouache because it will gum them up a little bit if you use them too much. So we're going to do a nice little gouache across here. Now, as you, well, as I, as you, when you use this, um, just kind of telling you what's happening because uh, this is what I found out. Um, you'll find that it will tend to resist. It looks like it's resisting and it's not settling down on the paper. Can you see that? It's not really covering as well as you would like, but that's inherent to the paper and you just work with it and it will eventually settle down and flatten. And you don't worry about that too much. I'm going to play with the sky a bit. Um, I'm actually going to make it flat eventually, but I'm going to play with it a little bit just to show you what you can do along the way. I don't really want clouds in here for this subject, but I'm going to make a few just so you can see how that goes. You see how it's not looking as though it's going flat? And that's frustrating because you think you've, you're have you not doing it right. And it's just the inherent way that the canvas works. And you'll see that this will just flatten down completely all by itself. You can help it to move a little bit by lifting it. You can make it flow if you want to. Um, what you do need to do is also have some Kleenex handy. So if you want to lift out a cloud or two, you can go right back to the paper very, very easily with this. I don't even use a wet tissue here. It's not necessary because if I wanted to soften that edge, I could do that very easily. And this is what you can do all the way through the paper, all the way through the, the painting. You can, at any time, you can go back and you can lift and take, unless you've used a lot of staining colors, you can go back to the paper. So what I'm going to do now is just loosen this up a little bit at the top here with some water and let it go just a little heavier at the bottom and lift it up so it runs down just a bit. So it's just a wee bit thicker down here, just a slight, just a slight darker tone. It doesn't have to be that much darker. Okay. Now 
you see that's beginning to settle down. But initially, it didn't look as though it was going to. So that's a good thing to know. Now, if I try to put that hill in right now, which is what I do in a watercolor painting, I'd go straight in so I'd get a soft edge. That's a little too dangerous on this paper because this paper stays wet for a very long time. And so that edge is going to bleed up more than it would in watercolor. So that's something you have to watch. So I'm just going to move to another part of the painting and play with that for a little bit. And then I'll come back to this. And I'm using a little burnt sienna and just a few colors in this painting today because it's more about the techniques. You can always play with as many colors as you like when you're doing it later. So I need um, a little brown um, with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. Let's open that up a bit so you can see where I'm going with the colors. A little dark brown I'll start. I'm going to add in a few things that are slightly darker towards the beginning of this painting. I'm do a little bit in the barn first of all, but just a little dark in there to start with. And color I'm going to use in the barn is a little raw sienna and some grays. So we can put that up there. Grays, I use um, ultramarine and burnt sienna for grays. I always use the French ultramarine. It makes a really nice mix, gray mix. And I always use the uh, Winsor Newton for these two colors because they're very, very transparent. The burnt sienna in a lot of other manufacturers is not transparent. And so it makes a big difference as to how the grays look. Okay. All right, so that's a good start. Now, I'm going to come underneath here and play with the idea that this barn, and this uh, is an, a little image that I have here that I've cropped down and moved over just a little bit, and that's what I'm working from. And so uh, it's a little bit of yellow in here, and that's not a good yellow. It's too much brown in my brush. Let's try again. A little bit of yellow in here, which is a nice contrast to, to the uh, and that yellow actually goes all the way through. And you can see that you can you can paint over everything um, because you can come back and you can lift out any of those colors at any time. So I'm just going to add that in to start with. And while I've got that on my brush, I'm going to add just a touch of that into the snow as well. And at some point, I'm going to stop talking here so I can focus on what I'm doing. But please feel free to type in questions if you have any. a slightly smaller brush here. That one's holding too much water.
Now the sky is dry enough, I can move back up to this area and put the hill in back there. Test my colour. It's not going to be quite dark enough. Just a little darker on that. Yes, I can paint right over the tree because I can lift out what I need later. I have a different method of painting on this paper than I do on regular watercolour paper because of what the paper can do. Very traditional little subject here. Just another little layer in there.
don't have to worry quite so much about edges on this paper because I can adjust all of the edges afterwards. stay wet for a very long time. That's a good thing. So as well as putting paper um, paint on the paper, you can also take it off. And so where I don't want some of that paint, maybe I want just a little variation in area here, I can just lift that off right away. And that's going to be too white eventually, but I can adjust it back and forth as I go. So it's a nice surface for being able to move back and forth and change things. I want to lift a little snow out on the edge there, I can do that. Just a damp flat brush.
Now here's where it becomes a little tricky because when you're trying to layer on an, a wash that's already settled down, this tends to lift the underneath wash. And so this was what I found a little frustrating when I first started using this. Or maybe I had too heavy a hand, I don't know. But it led me to start to use the mixed medium in media instead. play a bit more with lifting all the way through this idea of painting. Just a few more details in the watercolour and then I'm going to stop and move on to gouache. Before I do that, let me just finish off a few little things here, bring that down a bit. And if you make a mistake, it's not straight, you can just lift it off. And it's very, very forgiving in that way. And it's more controllable than Yupo, but in a way it's, it's just as forgiving as Yupo is as far as lifting goes but you have much more control on this and it has a much nicer texture than Yupo paper too. Start to give it a little bit of an old feel. be a little bit too light ultimately but I'm leaving some of this so I can play with it with the crayon with you so you can see how that works. They gather that I am not a purist watercolorist, but I am uh, very happy to do what's right for the painting and not worry too much about saving whites. And... So when I get into the slightly darker, heavier layers, I'm going to move to, to gouache. Let me get this dark in here. It's dry now. I can do that. <clears throat> okay, I need some information in this little area here.
see the advantage of lifting here. It gives you a lot more possibilities for, for adjusting edges. So it's not necessary to soften the edge at the time. You can come back and do it later when it's dry. And that before I put the gouache on there. Details in sooner on this one than you, than you might think in another painting. Okay, I'm going to stop there with the with the watercolor now, and that could just stand alone in many ways as a little um, interesting watercolor all by itself. But we're going to go a little further and make it. Let's just pull out some snow here on the side and make it just a bit more detailed. these coming down just a bit more and I'll pull out some nice white snow at the base here let those sit in the snow a little better pull this nice edge out this white and you can draw on this paper with pencil to start with, or if I don't want the drawing to show, if I don't want any edges, I usually use a grey um, watercolour pencil to draw. For this one I used a, a regular 2B pencil, so it, it is a choice, you've got lots of possibilities, or you can use a colour, you can have red lines if you're doing a green painting, or as you wish, it doesn't matter. Yeah, tighten up that just a little bit more. Okay, right now I've just used watercolour, okay, I've used um, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, uh, raw sienna on my palette here, I'm just going to move this to one side for a moment, I used ultramarine blue and burnt sienna for the browns, I used ultramarine blue and burnt sienna for the greys, in different mixtures. I used cobalt and cerulean for the sky. I used a little raw sienna for the gold tones there, which I'm going to tone down quite a bit in a moment. And um, that's about all as far as the watercolor goes. So now I'm going to put this to one side and I'm going to move to gouache. And that has to dry down just a little bit while I'm doing that. It, it's semi-finished. It's not finished completely. We could continue and finish it in watercolour in this particular case because there aren't any large areas where you have to put washes over the top. Um, but I'm not going to do that because I want to show you how to use the, the gouache as well. So in the tone of wash, the burnt sienna is just a little bit brighter. And for the gouache, I use a plate. And I just put out what I need. So I'll need a little white. 
eventually, maybe. Not quite sure yet. I'll need a little blue. This is the cobalt blue, so it's the warmer blue. And that makes the greys. And I'll need a little burnt sienna. And these are much more opaque in than the watercolors. So I've done most of what I want to be transparent in watercolor. And now I'm going to move to something a little bit more opaque. So that's probably all the colors that I need in gouache. And then we'll move on to the to the um, crayons. So I'm going to use a little gouache and for a while, probably another 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to take a break. Okay, so you can just get up and move around five minutes and then we'll come back again and I'll work on the rest of the, the demo. Okay, so um, same idea when we're mixing the colors. If we want grays and browns, we're going to use um, burnt sienna and ultramarine to get those mixes, either more blue for grays or more, um, more brown for browns. A little bit more paint maybe. Now this paint is a little heavier. You can see it's not quite as transparent. It can be transparent, but it's not quite as transparent. I'm going to use a little bit of the orange in here too, um, just to brighten up that orange a bit. So basically it's, it's a tonal painting today. It's more of a tonal painting rather than a colorful painting. But you could do the same painting in um, ultramarine blue and sorry, Prussian blue and burnt sienna, and you'd get a nice range of, of different colors by doing it that way. That would be an option. Okay, so I'm going to start now with something a little heavier, a little darker, and I'm going to start to add in some weight, a little bit of weight to the subject. Less transparency. And at any time, I can lift this off too. And that's the thing I really like about gouache rather than acrylic. Um, I do paint in acrylic, but I prefer the water-based mediums that you can move around. You can lift up and um, change. I prefer that. Let me just put a little bit of that in. We'll come back and adjust that a bit more later. Got some hard edges there that we need to soften down. So we can do that right away, or later, as you wish. We'll need to pull out a little snow in there. We can do that later, too. Maybe just a little touch of, of um, more of this feel on this roof. And on this one, we can go across with those lines just a little bit more. So now I'm going to add some age. And again, I could have done a lot more of this in watercolor, but I'm wanting to show you how to do this. So now you can see how clearly this sits on the top. It doesn't disturb anything that's underneath. And this is what I like about it, the fact that I can go in here and I can go straight over the top of this without worrying about lifting what's underneath. Up here it was a little iffy. And it did lift a little bit right there because I was using watercolor on watercolor. Now I'm using gouache on top of watercolor. I have a lot more control. And obviously I'm a control freak. That's obviously what I needed to do. <clears throat> and again, um, because it's water soluble and liftable on the surface, we can go in and we can change this at any time. Let's take that all the way through. And we'll make these just a little bit lighter back here. A bit more water in the mix. And a little cooler in colour too. Not quite so warm a brown just a little cooler like we have already that's just a bit too much okay Now 
Now I can take these all the way up to the top and it's probably a good idea because I need a little dark behind that edge of the roof or I could just leave them a little bit lower. I can't take them all the way up on this one. Okay, a little snow showing through there and change the tops of these with a little crayon later. And going back here now, have a little bit of more of this idea of foliage. The tree is the last thing I'll do when everything else is finished because it has to go on top of everything else. And I'm going to do that in gouache. This can go a little darker right away because it's going to be, I'm going to get into the, the really strong darks now. Just a little bit more of that. And this one then, because of that, needs to be a little bit lighter. So we need to go back and lift that back. I use a tremendous amount of Kleenex when I'm painting like this. Let me just lighten that up just a little bit more and make it more interesting in shape. And these little guys back here, probably just a little lower, not just a little too high on those, but you can see how easy it is to change. I hope you're all excited about playing with this um, idea. We need something to get us excited right now. Too much stuff in the world that is not exciting right now. I'm just going to soften these up just a wee bit. Now I could have done that with the crayon or the pencil, but I decided to do it with this instead. Like that now I have some darker tones in here. Make these a bit more grey. Come back and add some some lights to those later. These little guys need dark edges. There's a whole ton of them in there, but we won't put all of those in. Just a few more. Doesn't matter if they mix together because I'm not done with those yet. I can change anything along the way as far as how that looks. Just put a little bit more of that feeling of, of age in here. Those are not very dimensional. They will be eventually, but right now they're not. We'll get there. And let's, let's work on that a bit. Okay, let's see if we can make this little area in here a bit more interesting. Not quite sure what it is. It looks like some sort of planks or who knows? Doesn't matter. It's shapes. It's it's light shapes or dark shapes. That's all we have to worry about. Right now, the dark shapes are on the outside here. And the lighter shapes are going to be on this side. Just a little bit more.
I'm just using my sponge when I'm doing this. I'm putting the um, brush in the water and then just flattening it on the sponge so I can I can lift out a little edge, a little light edge. Now that would be impossible on watercolor paper. In that way, it would be a lot more difficult to do. going on here. Let's lift that out a bit more. A bit more light in a couple of these. Those are some sort of boxes. I'm not quite sure what they are, but it's not really important. As long as they're either lights or darks, it doesn't really matter. Excuse me. All right, a little too sharp edged in a few places yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's get a few darks in here. the tissues that are making me cough when allergic to <clears throat> paper sometimes. Okay, touch more dark on here. Okay with that right now. You can go just a little bit darker on the <coughs> on the orange. This turner gouache is particularly intense, and so the colour is much, much brighter. This is a subject that I'm doing from um, a tonal study that I did and from a photograph. So I'm looking at my tonal study while I'm working, and I'm looking at the painting that I've already done a little bit too, and I'm looking at the little photograph that I've got of the subject. So I'm using all of those. And it's to remind me of the time that we lived in Pittsburgh for a few years. I had never experienced snow like that before. I came from England and I was wearing polyester pants when I arrived in New York. And it had snowed about three feet the night before. And as I got off the plane, my legs froze instantly. I had no concept of how to layer clothes or how to deal with that sort of cold. And I have to say that two winters there was plenty to let me know I really didn't want to live there. I think you have to grow up in that environment. For me, it was just difficult. One of the difficulties was having children because you can apparently send them out to play when it gets up to zero and then they need to go party so you have to bring them in and unload them and unpack them and then when you go to the mall it's 70 degrees and when you come out it's minus zero or zero and you have to unpack and pack undress and dress children and I had a hard time getting used to that never quite sure what I needed to carry in. So England's a much more moderate climate and that's all I had been used to. We have snow over there, it lasts maybe a week or two. 
and that's about it. At least in the south. Okay, this is just a little too strong. Lift that out just a bit. It's jumping out a bit too much. We'll put another colour in there afterwards. Okay, so I can use a little white now. I haven't used any white before we stop here with this. And again, I am quite happy using white in watercolour. Those of you who have been in my classes know that um, I often say if it's okay for Winslow Homer, Turner, and John Singer Sargent to use white in watercolours or body colour, excuse me, it's okay for me. I'm not a, not a purist by any means. a little bit of white snow in between that and that dries down a bit. Give these a bit of dimension with some white. What you need to know about white gouache and light coloured gouache is that it dries darker than you expect and the darker colours tend to dry lighter. So it's just a little different than um, acrylic. It's going to be all the way around. Different than watercolour. Okay, that's going to be a dark tree back there. Don't need any more whites in there, I don't think. We're good to go like that. We can soften up the snow just a little bit more here. Take it up into, into that area. And let's pop these into the snow. Lose the bottom of them into the snow a bit more. interest in this area of the barn here so I'm going to lift out I'll put in a little dark first and then I'm going to lift out some lights and then we're almost done with this part of the painting let's keep that little light edge there and go up just a little bit more on that one I'll stop there for the moment. I'm going to lift out a little bit of snow in the corner here, just for interest. And one thing that I'm not too thrilled about is the shape of this um, piece of snow here. It's completely flat, so I'm going to try and change it. I'm going to lift out, just, I'm going to move this down so it comes a little bit lower. And I'm going to move the snow up a little bit. I don't want it to be down the corner of the barn, so I'm going to take it just a little higher. And that feels much better. Feels like a better shape. There's going to be a tree coming over here eventually. So let's change that just a bit. That looks fine. And I'll just add back in some of those goodies. The bottom here. The trees that are there. Bushes. 
and the edge of the barn can have just a little dark to accent it right at that point. a touch more of the idea of different shapes here. It's a stack of logs, I think. I'm not quite sure what from the picture. There's not a lot of detail in the photograph. So some of this I'm, <coughs> excuse me, um, making up a little bit as I go along. Okay, that's going to do for now. I'm going to let that dry down. I'm going to take a little break for five minutes and feel free to answer questions and maybe I can answer some of those during the break. <coughs> Excuse me. It says tissues again. Getting to me. And at this point we've got watercolour, we've got gouache, but no crayon and no pencil. Okay, so could kind of stand alone if you like. If I finish the tree, that probably would work. But one of the things that I don't like particularly about this is that sharp edge back here because it tends to change the feeling of the mood and um, stops the, the hill going back in space. And so I'm going to be adjusting that back so that you can see that. And eventually there'll be a mat on here. So you'll be able to see how that uh, will look when it's framed. So it's going to come down to about there when it's ready to go. So we have just a little bit more work to do yet. So let's take five and I'll stop painting for a few minutes. I'm going to move away from the gouache now and into the crayons and the pencils. So when we come back, that's what I'll do. I'll take a look at the list and see if you have any questions that I can, I can answer along the way. I may have answered them already. You have time to make tea or coffee if you need to. So the browns I'm using in gouache, um, I think I explained, burnt sienna and ultramarine, those are the two colours I always use for mixing browns. Good question from somebody. Is there a right side or wrong side to the canvas? Yes, there is. I'll get to that afterwards. I'll remind you about that. Okay, so the listing for the portfolio section, you go to the front page of the site, the site, 
and you choose menu and when you pull down the menu you'll see portfolio and then you should be able to find the the materials list So the answer to Steve's question is um, I've used watercolour for half of the painting and probably about two thirds of the painting and then I'm using gouache and then I'll be moving to crayon and pencil. So to answer Karen's question, I do not use good brushes for gouache. I like the synthetic brushes because the brushes will get gummed up if you use them constantly for gouache. Gouache is a heavier pigment and so it's not good for the best brushes. And uh, my brushes start as watercolour brushes and then they move to gouache brushes when they get a little too old for watercolour. And then they move to mixed media and then they eventually get thrown out. So basically they're old watercolour brushes that I use. But you don't want to use anything too uh, fancy for gouache. Any synthetic brush is fine. Any synthetic watercolour brush will work. Okay, so somebody's asking about the watercolour kit that I have here. This is a handmade uh, brass um, uh, watercolour palette from the Brass Box Company in England and it takes about two years to get because they're handmade and so there are alternatives that you can buy over here. I kind of thought I might have a question about that so I got them out. This one is called the Shy palette and it works in a very similar way to mine and it has a few more um, wells that you can put your paint in and you can buy this online shy shy palette okay and there's another one that works just as well too it's this way around or this way around doesn't really matter it closes up like that the other one that you can buy that has removable inserts for different palettes is called the cloverleaf palette it starts out square like this and you can open it up and has a stronger hinges than the shy one and the advantage of this one would be that you can lift this out so in this one I have a transparent palette and in um, another uh, I have another palette that I can drop in here at any time that's good to note and Nancy's just looked up Turner gouache and you have to remember that you're buying Turner Design Gouache and not Acro Gouache. Okay, Acro Gouache is acrylic. You don't want that because that's not going to lift. It's just going to be like acrylic. It's just going to dry and you'll just have to paint over it. You're looking for Design Gouache. Okay, and the type of board that I'm using is Gator Board, G-A-T-O-R, and that's all in the materials list too. So this is the Clover Leaf palette. You'll find both of these online if you search for them. And I used these before I had my, my other palette, and they work just as well. This was a gift, and so it was a nice gift. And, uh, but you'll have to wait for one of those. Okay. Nancy just looked up Turner Gosh, and they've got a great price at Jerry's Artorama. That's good to know through tonight only huh okay so this is gator board it's a very stiff board and it won't buckle don't use foam core if you use foam core your painting is going to end up being buckled because the water from the painting will will go through to the foam core board you need to use gator board it's completely rigid and it comes narrow like this or half inch size and i've used these for years and they just stay flat they're great G-A-T-O-R board. Okay. 
Yes, the crayons. Okay, I'll find the box for those. Crayons and nail colour. I just happen to have the warms in one box and I've got the cools in another box and so or mostly. Um, um, what they are is a water-based crayon and sometimes they're called oil-based water-soluble crayons and I haven't quite figured out why but basically they are completely water-soluble and I'll show you how those work in a moment because I have some here ready to go for the painting and we're going to work on those next. So uh, one of the things you can do with these two, kind of a fun thing to do, is to grate them onto the paper and then or spray first a little bit of water and then grate them into the spray. You can get some nice effects of different colours by playing with these crayons in different ways. You can work with them wet or dry or wet them up afterwards. They're completely liftable on this surface. So you can play as much as you like and take them off and on, just like I've been doing with the the watercolour, as you can see. Um, it's kind of fun to play with those. Set of 12 for $44. Okay, that's actually pretty good. Um, they do last a long time. The gouache lasts a long time. You keep it in the tube. And um, the other the other gouache I like has honey in it, and so it doesn't dry out quite as quickly. And that's the one I use with my watercolors. I use um, Graham brand, titanium white. But when I'm using the Turner gouache, I just usually use that on its own. And I will be doing a, a couple of gouache classes next month, if anybody's interested. And those are live classes where, like Zoom, um, where we talk to each other. And those will be going on the site pretty soon. One of the nice things about gouache is you can paint on a toned surface. And that makes for a slightly different, more interesting look to the paintings. So Karen, I've been using my brushes for gouache for, gosh, years and years. Um, I don't use this method all the time because I work in pastel, I work in watercolour, um, I work, I'm drawing, I do some sculpture, I do some printmaking. Um, but when I like to do this, I like to do a series of paintings with this method. And when I do poured paintings, I like to do a series of paintings in that same way. And I like to take the same subjects and explore them in different ways and so it's kind of fun to do too. You can see how beautifully flat this sits because it's stapled down. So you can learn from my experience on that one. I'm just going to erase out a little bit of the water um, pencil and that's the other thing you can do is you can take out the pencil anytime you like. If you've got paint over it, it might be a little bit more difficult to take out, but I don't need too much of that watercolour showing, that uh, line showing there. So I'll just take a little of that out. Okay. Right, now it's time to play a little bit with the crayons and pencils. I'm going to go in a little closer so you can see what I'm doing. The uh, roof on this isn't very refined right now. I'm not happy with it. It's not finished. It looks a little too heavy for this size of painting. So first of all, I'm going to loosen it up a little bit and purposely paint it a little bit like that so I could play with it and show you how to lift again. And we'll go back and add to that a bit later. So let's start with that. Same thing on this one. It's too regular, even though the reality is this. Um, it's too regular, it's got too many lines, it needs a little variation. So we'll play with that a bit and then I'll put the tree in at the very end. So the first thing I'm going to do is use the, the um, crayons 
and the crayons are, you can sharpen them. And I'm going to use a couple of the greys. I found the greys to be particularly useful in many different ways in these paintings. A little green, maybe. A little bit of the orange there. So basically all the same colours that I'm using in the painting, with the exception of the green. And, and now you just get to draw. So if I want just a little bit more stuff in here, I can draw that in. If I want to change the tone of this, maybe darken it down just a little bit, I can just draw that in. What's really bothering me is this edge back here. So I'm going to look at my greys and see which grey is going to be closest to the colour of that edge. I'll test it on the side here where I'm not going to use it. And I think I'm going to go with the lighter one. And what I'm going to do is go back in here and soften just a little further over so you can see. Soften this back edge. So this is one of the joys of, of using these crayons, is that you can change a tone, you can lighten a tone, you can darken a tone, you can add more color to an area. So I can add just a little bit of interest in here. But what I'm doing is I'm just lightening this up a little bit so it softens that edge. It becomes more like the edge of the of the um, sky in colour. And so it drifts back into the sky a little bit more. So I'm going to do that in a few places. doesn't need it quite so much here. It needs a little bit more here. So I'm drawing with the crayon on the surface. I'm using it dry to start with, but you can dip it in the water and use it wet. And what the, the thing that I found best actually is not to dip it into the water, but to put it on the paper and then use water to spread it. And on this side, I have just a little bit more tone, so I can use a slightly darker gray, maybe this one, to darken that up a little bit for interest. Maybe a touch in here too. Maybe just a little bit more on the back of this one as well. So it's it's subtle, but it's interesting and it works nicely to change that edge just a little bit. Make it even more soft if I want to by lightening it a bit more. I'm going to stop there with that now and say it's probably good enough for that, that background edge. So I can do the same thing in here on the side here and I can use a pencil and crayon in this area to lightly add those surface areas to the trees with a little bit more definition. Draw them in so a few sharper edges Nice soft tops. You can also use the brown for that. The crayon. If I want something that's a little darker at the base, use the crayon. But the pencil will give me a nice soft, a nice soft finish on the top there. That's just a bit too white in there. The background. Um, crayon, a background uh, trees here, seem to be a little too sharp. That's the gouache. The gouache will give you sharp edges, which is useful in some cases and not so useful in other cases. So I'm going to tone that down just a little bit with the grey. Move them back in space just a bit more with that colour. And at any time, you can go back in and you can just soften down anything that you've just done. Okay, 
see how that looks doesn't matter whether it's got crayon on it or whether it's got pencil on it so I've got sharper edges here softer edges there so what you're looking for in your paintings is, is what's most important so you can decide from what you're looking for a little bit more of that I'm going to add just a little color to these trees back here it's a little brown the crayon Now tighten up this edge just a little bit, give it some interest. I'm going to lighten up this edge just a bit, white, or the light gray. Soften it just a wee bit. Draw in a few more of these if you want to with the pencil, or we can darken this little area behind them. A really dark one here that I just used the edge of. Do a couple of little goodies down there that connect with that. Lighten and darken those just a bit more. This area here can be softened down. So the crayon gives you some possibilities of adjusting edges, softening goodies, adding just a little extra color in some places if you want to, changing things around a bit. that look a little older. I can sharpen the edge of that a bit. On this side. Just a little bit sharper. There we go. Leave it looking old on the other side. Touch more feeling of snow going across there come back and put some crayon on that afterwards let's soften these down just a wee bit more with some white and some gray so they feel a little bit more loggy and have slightly softer edges okay and I'm going to use the gray pencil here It's a lighter grey one too. That'd be nice. Just a touch more of that feeling of of metal roof. It's not showing up so much on the screen. I'll use a slightly darker one. Okay, so it gives us more of a feeling of that snow. Um, roof makes it a little older, a little more interesting to look at. We need to rough up this, um, this little area in here. 
just a touch of grey in there and put some brown in there maybe a little colour in these guys perhaps I'm not sure what they are um, I don't use a razor blade on this uh, subject no that wouldn't work um, because it would cut the it would cut the uh, canvas and so it's not going to work in quite the same way as it does in um, in a regular watercolor painting so rather than a razor blade I like to use this and if I want a little snow on the edge here I'm going to lift it with this because I can get it just where I want it and that works just as well so I don't think I've never tried a razor blade on here but I suspect it wouldn't be a good idea good questions okay let's have just a little bit more of that going on back here so we go out to the edge of where the picture is going to be I think I'm beyond that anyway let's have some interest on this white there not white we don't want don't want it to be too white in there we want it to be gray some of these so basically you're drawing on the paper and you're drawing in whatever you want to draw in doesn't matter it's your choice draw a little bit of that and this and we're getting close here I'll put some green goodies in here a little bit more dark and at the base of this area these are looking okay I can have a few more goodies going in there we're okay with that that's pretty soft that's looking even that edge there that I didn't finish off is looking pretty much okay I'm just going to soften off a little bit of the top in a few places and just change I lost my shape there I had um, more of an interesting shape for the trees so I'm just going to take the damp brush and take out just a little bit of that and pop that down a bit there we go that's a bit more interesting than, than it was before okay so let me just work on this a little bit and then I'll work on the tree and then I think we'll be just about finished on this one we can go a bit darker in here This is reading pretty well. We don't want it to be too light, so I'll just darken it down just a wee bit more so it doesn't jump out quite so much. It's jumping out a little bit more on the screen than in reality. Okay, so that's looking good, that's looking good. And now we're going to work on the tree, I think. This is just a bit too stripey over here, so I'm just going to change that a bit and link some of those together. Get rid of that stripey feel. That feels better. And just tighten that up a bit. And I think we're pretty good in there. This is all working fairly well. And this could have a slightly softer edge so what I'm going to do is run a little light light gray over the top to lighten that up just a little bit more so it's not quite so heavy there we go and a dark right about here going across and I think we're good to go on that so I'm okay as far as Pretty much everything is working apart from this roof which I'll just add a little bit of stuff to and technically it has a lot of these stripes but I don't really want all of those stripes and I think that's too much so I'll just give it a little bit of age a few places so it feels a bit old it really shouldn't be more important than this one it just needs a little touch and that should do it 
Okay, and now the tree. The tree is going to be brown, and um, what I'm going to do is paint in the tree with gouache and the shape of the tree first. So I'll just put this back in the box. And we can move on from there. There we go. So if your gouache is dried, which is likely that it has by now, uh, you can go back in and wet it up, no problem. So let me come out just a bit more. This thing I need to do is to decide on the outside perimeter of that tree and where it's going to go. And quite often those trees have a lot of, the winter trees like this, have a lot of branches that end up um, smaller branches at the end of the tree. And so I'm going to make those with some dry brush like this. And looking at the tree shape, I'm going to start maybe on the side here, put in just a little dry brush, that's fine. That could be just a little bit lighter, just a touch lighter. And dry brush up here. There we go, that's better. Okay, so now I'm, I'm getting the shape of my tree before I start to Put in the branches and this helps to hold these those little branches together there's a little bit of that on going over the roof too so we'll put some of the dry brush there and let's make this tree a bit more interesting in shape it's going up like that it can go just a little further over there and just a little bit more behind the okay and some more dry brush here Anytime I paint a tree, I paint the foliage first because that way I can fit the branches in between the foliage. The other way around, it tends to look very flat. Okay, that'll work. And now I'm going to use dark brown for this. And I'll add a little snow to it in the end. So let's make a nice dark brown. A little bit more of a grey brown, I think. Would be good. There we go. So you want it to be pretty dark. So there's a main trunk that goes up here. I'll go in a bit closer so you can see what I'm doing here. There we go. And that main trunk goes in and out of this foliage. So I'm going to do some of this coming from the bottom here, and that will pop out this little area too. It's a big branch that goes across here, connects up through there. I'm kind of making it up as I go along, as far as the branches go. But I just want to make sure I leave some spaces so it feels as though there are areas that have more foliage. Let's make this quite dark. Pops out that little unit down there. And this side is going to come down and connect. And I'm going to separate those two out with a little bit of light when I'm finished. Okay, so this gouache is not too thick. It's, um, and what I want now is a branch that comes off and goes over this. So I need to just add a few more branches in here first. So you're seeing it's drying just a little bit lighter. This is what happens in gouache. It gets just a little lighter as it dries. I think I'm going to make this a little thicker so I can run another branch off here and make it go over there.
So the main branches I'm painting with gouache. And then I'm going to come in and use the pencil for the rest. It's very useful, that pencil. And you'll see the tree will lighten up a little bit, and it will be a lot lighter when I add in the snow too. So I'm going to take the dark brown pencil now and use that to make a lot more of these little branches that go in here. Much easier than painting them in. And I can use a little bit more of that dry brush if I need to, to connect things together a bit more. Over here, or over here, or down here. Just a touch darker, maybe in the center here, where it goes over the background. darker in that place too. Okay. more paint and pencil and both and a little bit of each until you get what you want. Just play with it. <clears throat> could use a, a rigger or a script to um, add these in, but since you have the pencil and it works, you could do it like this. My pencil is dry right now. Um, if I were to make it wet, it would be a thicker line. And I don't really want a thicker line on here right now. So you can add as many more lines in as you wish, as many more branches. Or At some point, it's a good idea to stop and say that's probably enough. Just a little bit more dry brush right about there. Okay, and soften off the edge a little bit up here. Soften off that edge a little bit. You can draw on the wet paper too, that's another possibility, another option. I think we're going to go with that. Um, not too thrilled about this one right here, so I'll just take that out and soften that down just a little bit. See how that lifts? It lifts the paper, lifts everything. I'm going to put just a little bit more stuff in, but with gouache you can do that easily. One way, another way to soften it down is to use a slightly lighter um, pencil. 
and or take the pencil and soften the edge off towards the back. It's just another possibility. Let's just go over here a bit more and then I'm going to add some snow to the bottom of this. Don't like the way that hits on the corner there. It feels like it's um, not going in the right direction, so I'm just going to change that direction a little bit. Feels like a kissing edge there, so I'm going to move this over and bring it down that way when this is dry. Okay, so I'll change that a little bit. <clears throat> and now with the crayon, I'm going to add in some snow on the edge of the tree here, which will give it a nice little interest. And on this side too, just a little bit more. In just a few places. Now, you can use, if the crayon isn't very sharp, you can sharpen them, obviously, but you can also use this edge at the back here to, to make some thin lines that work pretty nicely on the top of branches. So, a little bit of snow there. towards the bottom here. We don't need too many that are uh, going in different directions there. Let me just put that extra branch in that I took out. So I'm going to want this to come across here now and not hit the edge of the building like it did. That was a shape problem. Okay, looking good. And go with that, I think. Just a touch more of the light in here. That's a good question, Kerry, is knowing when to stop. Yeah, it really is. Particularly when you're working with mixed media because you can just keep going back and forth. I find it more difficult with acrylic, actually. With this, it's easier somehow. Um, thank you. Okay, so let's take a look at the painting now and squint and see if anything jumps out and says, fix me. Okay, so when I squint, this seems to work pretty nicely. It looks like I could use another few lights in here. It looks like I lost a little bit of the snow on those guys. So I could maybe add just a little bit of that back in there. That looks like it would work. And maybe some separation as well. Separation's better with the sharper... Uh, paint. If I separate these out just a little bit more, I kind of lost that when I was playing with them. That works better. These guys here don't have too much interest, and so the reality in the um, photograph is that they have just a little bit of snow on them. So what I'm going to do is add some snow behind them, in between them, and kind of in here just a little bit, and then some snow on the outside of edge, edge of each one of these. That gives them a bit more interest, okay, so that seems to fix that problem. There's always going to be half a dozen problems that you need to fix. It's either going to be shapes or tones or colours or who knows, but they'll be there. Okay, that looks right, that's good. That's going into the snow, that shadow's there. Why is that shadow there? Doesn't really matter, as long as it works. Okay, a little bit more of that dark on the edge here. That's probably better done with pencil, actually. Little areas like that are better finished off with pencil because it's, you have a bit more control. This needs to be a little darker back here. And I think we're almost there now. Willing to take suggestions if you have any suggestions of what you think needs to be done. From where you're sitting. 
So the gold colour is actually part of the building. That's a good question. Um, it does add a focal point. It adds interest. And um, I decided to keep it in rather than change it because I thought it was um, interesting enough that it would, um, it would give you something to look at initially and then your eye can follow through uh, to the other areas of the, of the subject. I'm just a little bit of white in that. That too, just a touch more. Okay. Well, we could play for a little bit longer, but I think we're pretty good on this one. So I think I'm on the flat lawn area. That's possible that we could have more texture. Do we really need it? Is it about the front lawn? That's my question when I want to worry about texture. What am I trying to say here? In my picture, am I trying to talk about the um, foreground? Am I trying to talk about the background? Am I really worried about the, the barns? Is that just a support feature? Is it enough as a support feature? So that those are the questions that I ask in my painting is when I get to this point. So let's put the mat on and just see if we do need to have any more goodies in there. Well. I'm not sure we do. It feels to me like it's pretty okay um, with just a small amount of stuff in the foreground there. So if you felt for your painting that you wanted to put more in, um, okay, some people say it's enough, all right, and knowing when to stop is a good one, yes, um, and squinting really helps that. It helps you to understand where you're going and um, know what to look at and what where to stop. Um, I don't usually revisit these paintings too much. I might go back after a, a couple of days or so and just you know take a look and see. Um, what I really want on this side is just that edge. So I'm going to change this just a little bit. And let me just see how. I'm not happy with all of those being exactly the same. All of those spaces between the door. I don't think that adds anything to the painting, and so I think I'm going to change that a little bit so that doesn't happen in the final painting. I'm going to make this the edge of the door and lose that one down. So little things like this, you know, that bother you right away. Um, I do go back, especially when I'm doing commissions, um, dogs and animals and portraits and things. Um, I do go back and I have to put them away for a few days because when you've painted something, you're very tied to it and you can't, I can't see it clearly now. I mean, I can see to an extent, but you can probably see it clearer than I can at this point because you've been watching it and I've been painting it. There we go. That's better. I'll have that. And I think just a little bit more warm in there might be nice too in a few places just to add that. And yes, I do take commissions. I paint a lot of portraits of dogs and people. And I have, this year has been a lot of commissions actually. Um, and so I've got, um, and, and so then I put my commission hat on. And my commission hat is a hat that I wear when I'm painting for somebody else. And I, it's not about me. It's about what the client wants. And so I, I paint very differently um, most of the time. People don't want me to interpret their faces or their animals. They want me to paint them just the way they are. And so that's where my commission hat comes in. There we go. That feels better. So I think we're, we're pretty good to go with that. Let's move it over so you can see the whole thing. And that's going to come over there. I'll cut that off in the corner. And still think this is a little bit too light, so I'm going to turn it down so it disappears into the background, doesn't jump out so much. It's more about this barn and it's more about, um, about making it work. I'll go just a little bit further, there we go. Maybe that's a better way to go. Uh, making it work in the way that works for you. Okay. 
So the hills in the background seem to, yes, the soft edge in the hills in the background works really well, doesn't it? And these guys too, um, soft edges on the trees make a big difference as well. And you can take some of those off and use them into for just to change the shapes a little bit. That works pretty nicely. A little bit less snow showing through there, perhaps. Um, these seem to work okay. So hopefully that, that helps you to, um, with the idea of playing with the surface. And it was really about, you know, what you can do with the surface. So um, let me come back and, and talk to you now. And um, I hope that you've enjoyed that. It's getting a little warm in here. I'm getting hot as I, as I work. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the demo. I hope you'll come back and see me again sometime. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about watercolor, I have a lot of videos now on the site that I've done over the last um, nine months. In fact, this is what I've been doing for the last nine months, is building up this website and adding video goodies um, because I can't teach in reality at the moment. So uh, I'm looking forward to when we can get back to the classroom and we can all get together again. I miss you all. I miss everybody. And I'm hoping that that will happen in the not too distant future. Maybe by the end of next year, this year, um, we'll see how it goes. So hopefully if you have any other questions, please let me know. You can always email me. You can find me on my website. There's a link from this site to my website. And if you have any other questions, just let me know. But enjoy. I hope you'll enjoy trying this uh, new process. Okay. So I'll say bye for now. And I'll leave this up with you so you can look at it for a little bit longer. And... Hope to see you again.